Hello and welcome to this episode of Let's Talk, where we talk further about the clinical and practical implications of our second plenary session, all about the surgical treatments of peri-implantitis. My name is Gerrit Heikoop and I'm very honored to be joined by our three expert speakers that we saw on stage in that session. First of all, Ausra Ramanaskoute, you're from Germany as an associate professor at the Department of Oral Surgery and Implantology, the University of Frankfurt am Main. Welcome, Ausra. Thank you very much. Next to you, very happy to have you all the way from Australia, Lisa Heitz Mayfield. You're an adjunct professor at the University of Western Australia, associate professor at the University of Sydney and even Hong Kong, but most importantly, the editor-in-chief of The Choir. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Glad to have you here. And next to you, Alberto Monge. You are from Spain, associate lecturer at the Department of Periodontology at the University of Catalonia, but also an adjunct clinical assistant professor at the University of Michigan. Welcome to have you with us as well. Thank you so much. Let's start with the very basics. And that was also how we lined up the session yesterday. Ausra, you started with a talk giving us a very concise stepwise approach before we can even talk about either restructive or, re or resective surgery. Why was it so important to line up our audience before diving into the surgical part? Well, I think it is very important to follow a stepwise approach whenever we manage a pre-implantitis case. And as I out underlined in my talk, so we always need to start with identification of a local and patient-related factors. So, for instance, prosthetic design, we need to assess whether the patient is, um, possesses the prosthetic design that we, 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 he can clean. And also we need to assess whether a patient has a periodontitis because we know that this is one of the risk factors for peri-implantitis. Mm -hmm. So those are the initial steps to identify the risk factors. And the first treatment step is always the non-surgical treatment. And we know that in majority of the cases afterwards, we need to proceed with a surgical intervention. Exactly. But I was, I was curious by the fact that it's so important to put this on a plenary stage. Is it the case that maybe a lot of colleagues are just diving into surgery without properly assessing the case? Yes, I think that um, that is actually where, we, where, where treatment success starts with, with identification of those factors. Yeah, it sounds so basic, but apparently it's an important message to bring. In Lisa, fact. I see you nodding. Oh, yes. And I think, I mean, Astra, I'm sure you would agree that sometimes after the non-surgical therapy, the um, peri-implantitis can resolve, so you don't even need the surgery. So I think your presentation was fantastic, the way you outlined that stepwise approach is really important. Yeah, and we saw also saw in your talk in a very extensive flow chart, even kind of making more practical how you take these steps. Then you uh, zoomed in on the on the reconstructive surgery. What, what do you hope, I mean, people should watch the full talk, of course, but what do you hope people take away from your message yesterday? Well, you know, as dentists, we love to try and reconstruct things. We love to put something into the defect, fill it up. And um, it's interesting because of a lot of the studies that have been published, we've all been a bit disappointed in the outcomes. But what I really tried to focus on, and I think what we all agree upon... Well, hold on a second. Outcomes defined as? Out recurrence out of periodontitis? Well, no, or? outcomes defined as, um, as really the resolution of the inflammation, but also the reconstruction of the peri-implantitis defect and the minimization of recession. They're the outcomes we're looking for when we want to reconstruct something. Yeah, and you I, say that the findings have been rather disappointing. Yes, and the re, the, so the, the reason or the main message from my presentation was to identify the correct patient and importantly the, de, the correct defect ca configuration or characteristics to achieve a successful outcome. And what is the key one people need to, re to um, remember? The key one is, I think, the defect configuration. It must be a contained three or four walled intraosseous defect with sufficient depth. And we also discussed, all of us, the importance of having good quality soft tissue to help with flap management and also to reduce the um, likelihood of getting recurrence of disease because you get more inflammation when you don't have that good quality soft tissue. Exactly. I remember that vividly, three or four well contained. But what if that's not the case? Is extraction the only option? No, then you have to listen to Alberto's presentation. Let's, let's jump into that <laughs> one. Alberto, you zoomed in on the resective approach. Mm -hmm. 
What I found fascinating, uh, both Elena, our chair, presented a case with three implants failing or, or having severe periimplantitis. You presented a similar case with three implants. And I noticed in the audience interaction, people are like, why didn't you extract? Why didn't you extract? Without going into the case specifics, could you, could you share your considerations of when to choose for your approach? When to extract and where, or when yeah, to Yeah, what, what made you say, well, I think I can sort this differently? Well, in general lines, we can say that uh, the treatment must be uh, outlined in agreement with the patient. So if the patient is really willing to address these patient-related and these local predisposing factors, then you can jump to treatment. Otherwise, it may endlessly recur, no matter the technical skills that you have or whether you place a... Uh, a biomaterial or whether you uh, just do anti-infective therapy because uh, that's uh, the foundation. Huh? But uh, then, of course, you have all the features that you have to analyze. Uh, first of all, is uh, if you have an advanced bone defect defined as greater than 50% of the overall implant length, then the likelihood for disease recurrence might be about two or three times greater when compared to the disease recurrence occurring whenever managing moderate or slight forms of preimplantitis. Uh, then it's more sensitive, uh, the management of preimplantitis in the aesthetic area. Of course, if there is an aesthetic demand, uh, the only uh, treatment approach that you can use in the hope, not only of reconstructing the alveolar bone support, but also in minimizing mucosal recession with the ultimate goal of uh, enhancing uh, the patient's perspective and at the same time reducing the probing pocket depth might be rec uh, reconstructive therapy. But for that, of course, uh, the defect configuration and implant position have to be very comprehensively assessed to see whether that intervention exactly. there is Exactly. There was kind of the key message going throughout the session all the time. I still see, uh, try to see if I can get some generic, uh, generic guidelines out of this. So you say, for example, dealing in the aesthetic zone, a, a resective approach might be more difficult. That's going to be, then the clinician has to check for the prosthetic device because uh, the clinician may have the opportunity to, some ma to somehow mask any mucosal recession mm. Mm. or any intentionally trigger mucosal recession. For instance, whenever doing resective therapy by means of a hybrid prosthesis or by means of an implant retain of denture. So we cannot be so dogmatic and say right. implants with preimplantitis in the aesthetic area cannot be managed, but rather it's according to the case scenario. Exactly. Also, huh? Alberto mentioned an exposed implant. When we're exposing implant, we get to a topic that was also very actively uh, uh, discussed in the, the audience interaction yesterday, the implantoplasty. Mm -hmm. You shared a little bit about the uh, opportunities and challenges with that technique. Can you, can you briefly summarize? What is it and, and what should people uh, be careful about? So as discussed yesterday, implantoplasty might be considered as a part of a decontamination approach at the implants, at the parts of the implants that are exposed at the non-contained parts of a defect. So the goal of a procedure is to create a smooth surface, which would be less susceptible for plaque accumulation. So it means to reduce the risk for reinfection after the treatment. As I also showed the data, implantoplasty does not have an effect on the extent of postoperative recession. So this is, in fact, not the, the factor that influences the recession. But, of course, we have to be careful when we perform implantoplasty in terms of the mechanical properties of the implant. So we, if we overdo the procedure, we might end up with mechanical complication. That is does does that happen often? Well, personally, I did not have any case of an implant fracture, maybe... Alberto or Lisa, you would. Uh... Uh, do you mean after implant? Yes. Place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you like overdo well, it a little bit. No. Well, I mean, actually, the, there are there is literature showing that there are it, it's it's not very common mm. to have have this. But if you have a narrow implant and you start being too aggressive, I think it could be a real risk over time. And I mean, as we discussed yesterday, implantoplasty is is not really something that we all do. I don't, I don't use that technique. So there is some controversies, of course, in many of the things we discussed yesterday, but that's the problem. We don't have always enough evidence to say exactly the way we should go. So I agree with you both. We have to weigh up many factors and make decisions based on the 
the this particular the case. and also the patient's wishes. I think well, let's really zoom get that. in this. Let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about that patient. Let's take it a little bit away from the surgical aspect because all three of you also agreed on the fact that follow-up therapy, the fourth step in your approach, was crucial, and also the patient's adherence to the therapy. We hear that a lot in these conferences, yet we also know the reality is, I don't know if it was in your talk or somewhere, so I figured like 50% of the patients don't adhere. Mm -hmm. Any tips, tricks, this is more about patient management than surgery, but and anything we can do to make these patients more um, go inside with the things you prescribe. So this is an important point because indeed supportive pre-implant care is critical for the long-term stability of the heart and the soft tissues. Indeed, uh, generally speaking, uh, it is known, and I like to known, uh, that the management of pre-implantitis is not effective. But that's not a fact. We have not shown, and I'm very happy because Lisa showed in the randomized clinical trial a very high survival rate and, of course, a very high uh, disease resolution rate. What is the point here? To control the local and the systemic confounders and to make sure that the patient will adhere with their supportive pre-implant care. Yeah, the... Okay, but make sure. Yeah. Let's zoom on make do sure. Do what yeah. do you do? <laughs> well, you have to be more selective. So it's not a matter of just jumping to surgery or to non-surgical therapy. It's a matter of motivating the patient from scratch, from the beginning, and just making sure that those are good candidates. If they are not good candidates... Do you send people away? Well, no, you can just uh, tell them that you cannot do anything better in order to maintain their implants. Lisa? Well, I, I think we all struggle with this. You know, I, I had a patient the other day who was very compliant and then with COVID he just disappeared mm. and now he's come back with a problem. And, um, but he knew, he remembered what I told him from the start, how important it was for him to come back Every three months, I think we all agreed on that, after a surgical procedure. And for some patients, that's not what they're going to do. And then I would tend not to go down the path of a reconstructive approach, which is more costly and you know, the, that might not but be the right patient. But is this something you always just find out in hindsight? I mean, you say better case selection, so you would perhaps already at, uh, at the start say, well, I will not... That, going that, to this therapy with you. That, that's critical in the decision making on whether to extract or to yeah. maintain a ah, managed implant. Exactly. Body. Okay, there I got you. If so, the patient and, is not yeah. really sorry, Lisa, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say to, to Alistair, that might be also something you assess during your non surgical therapy, exactly. how compliant the patient is in, in that exactly. phase of therapy. Because sometimes, even though you explained that you uh, reevaluate after six to eight weeks, Sometimes you might continue the evaluation to see how compliant your patient is. And you, it might be some time before you make that decision as to whether to go exactly. to surgery. And I think from the very beginning, before we start any treatment, we need to make it clear for the patient that he needs to come back after the surgery mm -hmm. because the treatment success depends on the compliant mm -hmm. of the patient. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning, it needs to be clear for the patient. Yeah. It sounds like a big uncertainty to me. Eh? We are, the treatment success depends on the compliance of the patient, but the patient is the one thing you can't control. Yeah. For instance, I always try to explain to the patients that after the surgery, at least two times per year, he or she needs to come back and for the control. What do you do then? Just for cleaning, control? Or? Control and cleaning, like maintenance appointments. And exactly. actually, the majority of the patients, we, we agree to come. Okay, let's zoom in on a, on a specific case. Obviously, what we do know about periimpetitis, although we don't understand the disease, but that smoking is a big risk factor. Mm -hmm. There was actually in the session a, a question about a heavy smoker coming with periimpetitis, where you then were triggered to say, well, I'm going to try to help this person ne nevertheless. How do you deal with that? Do you make them quit smoking first, or what, what, what is your consideration? Well, of course, today we know and we have data that smoking is a risk factor for periodontal and as well as peri-implant diseases. But to be honest, if I have a smoker patient and he has a peri-implantitis and that he needs a treatment, that would not be a contraindication for me to proceed with a treatment. I don't but know it what... might then depend on what type of treatment you propose. You might earlier go for extraction. Is that what I understand from this? Well, th that's a good point. Uh, in a smoker patient, I will never go for a reconstructive therapy. I will prefer 
to try to shift the defect configuration towards a horizontal bone loss. So resective interventions for pocket eliminations are, are carried out. That's my preference. And mm -hmm. it's only personal preference because there is not evidence-based support in that. I, I would tend to do the same, but I, I really take Astra's point that she, she, she wants to do everything she can to help the patient if they are, let's say, really wanting to do everything they can to keep their implant. And not everybody is. Yeah. Not everybody is wedded to their implant. I know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, trying, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what that means in practice, right? Bringing it from this conference to the clinical chair site. I mean, that's, what kind of decisions do you make? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's where we discussed yesterday. You have to look at the position of the implant, how important it is in the reconstruction. Sometimes you can do without one implant, as we saw in the great case that our moderator, Elena, showed. So, you know, this is not an easy, easy fix with a recipe, but I think what we all tried to do was present the factors that must be considered in terms of patient-related factors, site-related factors, and, um, you know, the... You have to get to know your patient before you do these procedures. If, if, if you know the patient, you can often direct them in the right way. That's what they're asking us to do, give them a good direction. But ultimately, um, they are responsible for their own maintenance care, I believe. It's a good valid point, right? It's a, it's a dance together, but ultimately it's their, I would say mouth, but we would say oral cavity in this Congress. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for your time and uh, your talk. Anything uh, final uh, comment to add, Alberto? Well, uh, I will highlight again the key message that was delivered here in this Let's Talk, which is, first of all, to control all the factors that play the role during the initiation of disease, because otherwise the disease cannot be managed by any means. Exactly. And uh, supportive periotherapy, it's key. It's key because the patients have shown to be susceptible to have periodontal disease, later to have peri-implant peri disease, and now we want to minimize the likelihood for having disease recurrence. So that's something very important. The patients have to be motivated and instructed for self-performed oral hygiene, which has to be tailored according to every single case scenario. I just know what I, my dentist tells me every year, and it's the same message every year anyway, but I guess I'm, I'm not dealing with a severe disease. That's but, but, different, But right? the dentist often commit the same mistake uh, over and over again, which is to believe that the patients know how to brush their implants ah. and how to brush their teeth. We have to instruct them how to do it and which instruments are more suitable. Beautiful. Nice addition. Ausra, final word from you. So I would say the key message also from my presentation yesterday, so we always need to follow the stepwise approach. As Alberto said, control of patient and local related risk factors. We always start with a non-surgical treatment. Whenever needed, we proceed with a surgical intervention, I would say the majority of the cases. And the surgical approach we select according to the defect configuration and afterwards supportive therapy. It's absolutely a key essence for the treatment outcomes, to maintain the treatment outcomes. Beautiful. I can imagine that you're now super curious to see this very clear presentation, so make sure you click on the full Plenary 2 session, which was chaired by Jill Alcaforado and Elena Ferrero. And uh, the session has three very concise presentations and then a wonderful, almost 30 minute, I think, uh, audience driven discussion. So it's really worth your time. Thank you for your time here in the studio and thank you for watching. <laughs> <laughs>